Hello, hello. You're listening to Andy's Book Club. If you're new here, welcome. This is a show where we go over an exciting book chapter by chapter on a weekly schedule. Every week, I provide a recap of the chapter we're covering, and I add my commentary as we go along. If something requires more explanation, I might reserve some time at the end of the show and discuss it in more detail. So, whether you're studying for a test, writing an essay, or if you're like me, you're just super passionate about reading. This show is perfect for you. As a reminder, this show is available on YouTube, Spotify, and a whole bunch of other platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the links for all those other platforms are down below in the description. Or if you prefer, you can simply just search for Andy's Book Club directly on your favorite platform.、Uh, but wherever you might be listening from, if you like the show, be sure to follow and subscribe. This show also has a Twitter page, so if I need to post visuals, I will do so on Twitter. So be sure to follow me there.、Uh, last week we talked about the terror that was the reign of Magor the Cruel, who brutally executed at least two of his wives and countless other lords and the families of the other lords and pretty much anyone who just so much as looked at him the wrong way. After the death of Magor, under mysterious circumstances, Jaehaerys. The third son of King Aenys and Queen Elissa, and grandson of Aegon the Conqueror, at the tender age of fourteen, ascended to the Iron Throne. People didn't know what to expect from Jaehaerys at first. He was never expected to be anywhere close in the line of succession since he had two older brothers, but they were both killed at the hands of Magor. So the realm looked on at Jaehaerys with nervous anticipation. Having been traumatized by Magor's time as king,、uh, but first, when I said that Jaehaerys ascended to the Iron Throne, this was in fact not something that was met with universal approval.、Uh, so the argument went that Prince Aegon, Aegon the Uncrowned,、uh, which is Jaehaerys's older brother,、uh, should have been king if Magor did not usurp his throne. Although Prince Aegon was now dead, his twin daughters, so Jaehaerys's nieces. Arya and Rhaella should also have a claim on the throne, specifically Arya, since she's the older of the two.、Uh, some argue that Rhaena, Jaehaerys's older sister,、uh, should inherit the Iron Throne herself,、uh, since she's the eldest surviving child of King Aenys, so she's older than Jaehaerys. However, this argument all boils down to whether females could inherit the throne,、uh, or should the throne pass on to the closest living male to the line of succession.、Uh, so you can see this theme come up over and over again.、Uh, Lord Rogar Baratheon, the then patriarch of House Baratheon, opposed the idea of female rulers. This isn't Dorne. He once stated bluntly on the matter. Recall that it's the tradition of the Dornish that females and males be treated equally and equally prioritized、uh, as the ruler of Dorn.、Uh, so the ruler of Dorn is just whoever is the oldest in the line of succession, no matter if it's male or female. And this might have been a bigger debate if Queen Rhaena or her daughters wanted to be the monarch,、uh, but it appeared that none of them showed any interest. Queen Rhaena, having been traumatized in recent years, first with the death of her husband. Uh, Aegon the Uncrowned, and then having been forced to marry Magor,、uh, had come to hate King's Landing and wanted nothing to do with the king's court. So the debate was settled: Jaehaerys would be king. Queen Dowager Alyssa would serve as his regent until he turned sixteen, and Lord Rogar Baratheon would serve as the hand of the king. The first matter at hand for Jaehaerys was how to deal with Magor's supporters. During the end of Magor's reign as king. Most of his followers had abandoned him and sworn fealty to Jaehaerys, but most is not all, and among those who resisted included the Lords Darklyn and Staunton, along with the King's Justice, the Commander of the City Watch, and a whole slew of smaller government officials.、Uh, when Lord Rogar Baratheon arrived in King's Landing with his army, he promptly arrested anyone who even had a hint of supporting Magor. Uh, which included all the servants and the women, and anyone who attended the wedding of the Black Brides.、Uh, the people arrested were thrown into the dungeons to the point where the dungeons were overflowing, and a decision had to be made on what to do with these prisoners,、uh, since there was just no more room in the jail cells. Queen Dowager Alyssa argued that since Magor was a usurper, anyone who served under him was 
in effect complicit in treason, uh, so they should all be put to death. She was not in a particularly forgiving mood, since recall that Megor had killed two of her sons, Aegon the Uncrowned and Viserys. Lord Rogar, usually the most aggressive person in the room, was actually the cooler head in this discussion and advocated for clemency. However, his reasoning was not because it was out of the mercy or kindness of his heart. Uh, it was because if they decided to execute all the prisoners, then anyone who still resisted Jaehaerys uh, would be disinclined to bend the knee and rebellions would have to be put down one by one. Instead, Lord Rogar advocated for having a series of trials where only the worst offenders, those who assisted Megor in a material way, would be put to death. Jaehaerys, against the advice and wishes of his hand and his mother regent, climbed into the Iron Throne and ordered a general clemency for all the prisoners. There will be no trials and no executions. I will not begin my reign by bathing in blood, he announced, and the realm needed to know that he was not going to be a second Magor. Although as of yet, Jaehaerys had not officially been crowned or anointed as king, his unwavering tone and determination got people to listen. Although Queen Dowager Alyssa was not too happy that her son decided on this matter in a way that was opposite of what she wanted, she decided to relent her anger against Magor's followers and support her son, fearing that overruling her son would make him look weak. A looking weak, if you recall, was the exact problem that plagued her husband and Jaehaerys' father, uh, King Aenys. Although this was not to say that clemency was absolute, upon renouncing their allegiance to Magor and renewing their vows and fealty to Jaehaerys, the lords and knights in question were also compelled to send their sons and daughters to court as hostages, in case they ever wanted to try anything against Jaehaerys. And the clemency did not extend to the headmen and confessors who aided Queen Tiana of the Tower, who tortured to death Jaehaerys' brother Viserys, among many other people. Uh, those who had aided Tiana were executed, and their heads delivered to Queen Dowager Alyssa, who finally got some semblance of revenge for the death of her son. For the Kingsguard, although many of them had in the end decided to abandon Magor and follow Jaehaerys, by doing so they had broken their vows as Kingsguard, since they had sworn to protect Magor. Jaehaerys stated bluntly that he will not have any oath-breakers in his court. They were given the opportunity to join the Night's Watch instead, except for Sir Maladin Moore, who was the one supposedly ordered by Magor to cut out the tongue of Queen Ciri's high tower when she made a disparaging comment against Magor, uh, but the knife ended up slipping and cutting open her throat instead, leading to her death. This version of events was denied by Sir Maladin. However, even if this story was not true, he did admit to have been the one who had arrested Queen Tiana when she fell out of favor with Magor and was present when Magor executed Tiana by cutting out her heart. Uh, so at the very least, he can be charged as partially responsible for the death of a queen, if not two. Uh, so unfortunately for Sir Maladin, he got executed. Still, for the most part, Jaehaerys' general clemency was very generous. And among many lords who were on the fence about supporting him, uh, they soon decided to bend the knee to Jaehaerys. However, there was still the issue of the faith rebelling against House Targaryen. Magor's strategy of dealing with it by killing every faith militant he could find never truly worked. There were too many faith followers, and it often just aggravated the issue. The greatest enemy of the crown was now a fat, loud, and bolsterous man named Septon Moon, who had a habit of binge drinking and impregnating every girl who he laid eyes upon. Still, he was popular, and people listened to his sermons, where pretty much every day he would make a sermon denouncing the Targaryens as abominations. Officially, though, the High Septon at the time was in support of the Iron Throne, and Septon Moon was an outcast that represented a fringe movement. Uh, so his High Holiness, the High Septon, implored Lord Donal Hightower, the Lord of Old Town, to arrest Septon Moon. Donal, however, dragged his feet on this. His official reasoning was that he did not want to shed the blood of those who believed in the faith, uh, but unofficially many people said it was because he did not want to start a conflict with Houses Oakheart and Rowan who were in support of Septon Moon. Jaehaerys called a meeting with his family. 
Between him and his sisters, Reyna and Alizan, they had three dragons, which would probably be enough to end Septon Moon and his followers by force if necessary. Queen Dowager Alyssa, though, expressly forbade this idea and reminded Jaehaerys of what happened to his grandmother, Queen Rhaenys, on that faithful day in Dorne, uh, and why just because you have a dragon, it doesn't mean that you're totally invincible. Jaehaerys himself preferred a less flashy way to deal with Sept and Moon anyways, uh, so dragon combat was off the table for now. Uh, but as if the gods themselves had been listening, the discussion on what to do with Moon was all for moot, since the issue would resolve itself. Late one evening, after a long day of preaching, a beautiful young woman had brought Septim Moon a bottle of wine and claimed that she had needed to ask him a favor. This wasn't anything unusual since Septim Moon's sexual appetite had been well documented, so they let her in. Later that evening, the guards heard a scream and a cry for help. Septim Moon was found clutching his neck, which was profusely bleeding, his throat had been slashed open, and he fell to the ground and died. Later, it was discovered that the wine had also been poisoned. The young woman, who was likely the assassin, fled during the chaos and was never found. Many have debated who the woman was who assassinated Septon Moon. It was unlikely that she acted by herself, so some speculated she was a faceless man, which is a person from a guild of assassins from the free city of Bravos, uh, which is located on the continent of Essos, and this guild specializes in disguises for the purpose of carrying out assassinations. And by disguises, I don't mean they just wear a mask. Uh, they use magic or some other means, and they can literally turn themselves into another person perfectly. Anyways, we'll never know for sure. Uh, but after the demise of Septon Moon, his followers broke into different factions and started fighting among themselves. Uh, many people just also straight up abandoned the cause and chose not to resist the Iron Throne further now that their leader was gone. The assassination of Septon Moon removed the last obstacle to Jaehaerys' ascension to the Iron Throne. And with a path to Old Town now clear, Jaehaerys made his way there to be officially anointed king by the High Septon. During the feast after the anointing by the High Septon, Jaehaerys met with Sir Joffrey Doggett, the Red Dog of the Hills who led the warrior sons against Magor. Jaehaerys rescinded the bounty placed on the heads of Sir Joffrey and members of the warrior sons, but at the same time firmly rejected Joffrey's request to rearm, stating bluntly that the faith had no more need for swords now that he was king, since the faith and the crown were to be on the same side again. Jaehaerys then shocked his court by asking Sir Joffrey to join the king's guard to which Joffrey accepted with tears in his eyes. We again see the brilliance of Jaehaerys. His ability to win people over and avoid violence whenever possible is a fantastic quality to have as a king, and this would continue to benefit Jaehaerys, and by extension, the entirety of Westeros, for years to come. Jaehaerys stayed in Old Town for nine days. Upon his return journey back to King's Landing, he was greeted by cheering crowds. All throughout the land, the poor fellows had heard of the clemency he gave to Sir Joffrey the Red Dog, and many came to beg for the same clemency. Jaehaerys gave clemency on the condition that the poor fellows go join the Night's Watch, and many decided to take him up on that offer. It was said that within a moon's turn, so within a month of Jaehaerys becoming king, he managed to reconcile the crown and the faith, and essentially undid most of the damage that had been sowed by Magor. Uh, all of a sudden, things started to look up for Westeros. And for once, let me end the episode on a happy note. Next week, we'll talk about the real start of the reign of King Jaehaerys and many of the policies and reforms that he would push through that would really, hopefully, take Westeros into the next golden age. Stay tuned.